So today we're here to uh, talk a little bit about stress management while job hunting. We know that this is a pretty stressful time with everything that's been going on. And so we just wanted to give some fun tips and information and insider info on how to manage that during this unique time that we all face. And so we're really lucky to be joined um, by assistant professor of management here at Oakland University in the School of Business, Caitlin Dembski, who's going to talk to us a little bit about some ways to effectively manage our stress. And so um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Caitlin. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to be here with you today to talk a little bit about stress management, um, particularly during the job search time. So I am looking forward to sharing with you some really actionable tips and strategies for managing your stress during this period of your life. But also my hope is that these tips will be things that you can carry on into your lives even after you've secured that dream job. Um, so these are really actionable evidence-based things that I'm gonna be sharing with you today. Now, if there are questions or reflections or thoughts or anything during the session, please feel free to share that um, in the chat or you know, unmute yourself and ask. I'm happy to um, pause and take questions. Okay. So I know we don't have a lot of time together today, but I had a couple of main learning outcomes or goals, things that I want you to be able to walk away from this session having a good understanding of. And so before we get to those stress management strategies, I want to talk a little bit about what stress is and some outcomes of stress. So what happens when we experience stress over a long period of time? And then what we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about really are some of those practical, actionable ways to manage stress. So first of all, talking a little bit about what stress is. So I want to start off with a definition of stress. We all likely have some definition that we carry in our own minds of what we believe stress to be. And even among researchers, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about stress and defining it. And so when we're talking about this today, really what I'm referring to is a process. So stress is a process through which psychological experiences and demands, what we call stressors, produce both short-term and long-term changes in mental and physical health. These changes or outcomes are things that we call strains. And so we have a lot of research on this topic and the American Psychological Association actually does pretty regular surveys of the US public to understand our experience of stress. And they found fairly recently that about one in five adults say that they're not doing anything to manage their stress. They're not engaging in any sort of activities to help address their stress levels. And so you, by being part of the session today or watching this recording are actually doing something, you're going outside of that um, one in five and, and making a change or trying to find some activities um, to help manage your stress. We actually see um, quite a lot of people reporting that stress, particularly stress at work, but this could be any type of stress, actually makes them sick. And we have a really small um, proportion of people that even report um, extreme outcomes of stress like being hospitalized. So this can pose really serious risks for individuals. And generally what we see are that work and money tend to be the two biggest stressors for people. So especially when we're thinking about the job search, both of those things are in play here. You're looking for work so that you can make sure you're in a financially stable position. So definitely things that might be leading to some stress here. Okay. Now, we know that stress can come from all sorts of different sources, both at work and outside of work. But because we're talking about this in the context of your job search, 
I wanted to focus on that particular area for a couple of a few moments. And so likely if you're going through the process of job searching right now, I don't need to tell you that you're probably experiencing some stress, that you're likely something you're feeling on a pretty regular basis. Um, but there are some really reasonable, justifiable reasons why you're feeling like that. When we're going through a job search process, there's a lot of uncertainty of, involved, even under normal circumstances. And we're definitely not living under normal circumstances right now. Um, uncertainty of if that position you've applied for is going to be available, if you qualify, if you're still going to get an offer. Um, and with that, some lack of control, not really being able to control a lot of these external factors that are in play here. Um, there may be financial concerns. Maybe you personally have financial concerns of needing to get that job to make ends meet. Um, and related, there are a lot of economic concerns as a kind of a downfall of the um, pandemic we're living through. A lot of companies are experiencing hiring freezes right now, which can lead to some heightened stress. And then the last thing I wanted to mention here too is that living in the US, we live in a very work centric culture. Um, a lot of people derive their identity from their work and what they do. And so if you are in the process of looking for a job um, or even wondering, you know, what it is, what do I want to do? What should I be doing? Um, this can lead to kind of an identity crisis of sorts for you. So that in and of itself can lead to some stress. So all really reasonable, justifiable reasons why you might um, be experiencing some stress around your job search. Okay. So, and I know we've had a couple of people join us in the last couple of minutes. I wanted to just welcome you and um, thank you for taking the time to be here today. So I wanted to just kind of generally put out a question and I'll give it a minute or so if people want to respond to this either by unmuting themselves or writing something in the chat. Um, but I'm just curious, broadly, what are those of you that are on, what are you currently doing to manage your stress, if anything? Well, um, Caitlin, I can kind of get the conversation going a little bit if you'd like. Yeah, sure. um, one of the things that I am trying to do is just be a little bit more active, even if it's just a little walk, it seems to help me mentally as well. So just moving my body a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure um, what anyone else's feedback is. Christiana says yoga and other exercise. Yeah, that physical movement is fantastic for dealing with stress and just getting your body active. And that's a really popular, um, popular response. And it's a healthy one too. Um, I'm also seeing walking puzzles, gardening, private time to relax, um, like music too. So yeah, anything we can do to kind of just relax and, and turn down that our ramped up systems that we have going all day. So these are all really great things that um, you all already seem to be doing. And it's great too, because a lot of examples I'm hearing don't overlap perfectly with what we'll be talking about today. So these are just kind of extra tools in your toolbox. <laughs> yeah, Emily, I also, I bought some plants recently, so I'm gonna be, become a little novice gardener <laughs> over here myself as a form of, of stress management. Let's see. Okay, so with all of those things in mind of things we might already be doing, we might be already protecting ourselves from some potential outcomes of stress. And I do want to start with the caveat um, because I think I would be remiss in mention, not mentioning this, but there are situations in which stress can be a positive thing. Um, stress can encourage us to higher levels of performance. It can be motivating. Um, so it's not all bad all the time. And I want that to be the takeaway, um, or I don't want you to take away like 
let's get rid of all stress. We can't ever have any. First of all, it would probably be impossible to completely remove. And also it can be um, good on occasion. But a lot of what I'm gonna share in these next couple of slides, these outcomes occur when we're experiencing chronic stress. So we're experiencing stress a lot of it over a long period of time. So, you know, in the context of a job search, depending on how long you are going through that process and experiencing stress, you might start to see some detrimental outcomes if you're not managing that stress um, effectively. And so I'm just gonna kind of skim over these briefly, and this isn't a exhaustive list, but we can typically categorize some of our outcomes of stress in three buckets. So um, one being psychological. So, you know, I've been hearing this a lot from people over the last few months, but this sense of like brain fog or I'm having difficulty just like thinking clearly and focusing, that can be a sort of cause of stress or excuse me, an outcome of stress. Um, also, if any of you are grinding your teeth at night or seem to be eating more or less than you have in the past, that can be because you're experiencing a lot of stress. And then lastly, some of those physical outcomes, we might find ourselves becoming ill or having um, back pain, stomach aches, high blood pressure. Um, if we're experiencing a lot of stress over a very long time, so this would be like over the course of your lifetime, really, that's when we start seeing associations um, with things like coronary artery disease. So if that startles you, that's a very long term kind of over the lifespan um, outcome. Yeah, and some of these, I'm noticing some comments in the chat. Some of these might be things we don't even realize we're doing or we maybe previously haven't associated with stress. So just some things to um, kind of give you food for thought and make you aware of. Okay. So getting to the part that I know most of you are here for today um, and we'll take some time to really focus on and unpack a couple of strategies. And so along with this session, I also created a handout that um, I think you should have received when you registered and I think Emily will be sending out as a link after the session as well. But in that handout, I actually listed 10 different stress management um, strategies. And so um, Veronica, I see you're on, that's probably something you're familiar with from our work in stress class. Um, but there's other tool, tools that you can use for stress management that I won't go into super detail in here, um, but that go beyond this presentation. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Emily. Okay, so two strategies that I want to talk about a little bit um, over the next several minutes is mindfulness and a gratitude practice. And so, for both of these, I want to share a little bit of the research evidence for this, why, what we know about it, what kind of beneficial outcomes it has. And then for mindfulness, we're actually going to take a few minutes to practice a mindfulness meditation. Um, and then after each of these, I'm going to share with you a few implementation suggestions. So um, thoughts for how you might be able to incorporate these into your day-to-day um, -day lives. Okay. So the first strategy I have here is something that you've probably all heard of. It's becoming very popular. It has become very popular in the last few days. Um, and this is mindfulness. And so when I refer to mindfulness, what I'm really referring to is this awareness that we cultivate um, that comes through paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. So there are a lot of different um, pieces in there to unpack and really what it has to do with or what we're focusing on here is not necessarily stopping ourselves from having thoughts or shutting those thoughts down at all. It's giving ourselves time to acknowledge the thoughts that we're having and to kind of let them pass non-judgmentally. 
instead of thinking, oh, I'm feeling really anxious. Why am I feeling anxious right now? Maybe I should be anxious that I'm anxious. Just noticing those thoughts as they come up and letting them move along. So mindfulness as we know it today, that's really become popularized. Um, it was started in the late 1970s by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. And he started researching mindfulness as a tool to use with individuals with chronic illnesses. And he found a lot of um, really beneficial effects of this practice. Now I say that it started as we know it today in the 1970s, really mindfulness stems from Buddhist traditions extending back a very long time. Um, so that was, it was not new in the 70s when Dr. Kabat-Zinn kind of popularized it. Um, much of how it's taught today though is from more of a non-secular perspective. So we see a lot of benefits from practicing mindfulness and a lot of these are through mindfulness meditation, although I'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about other ways we can practice mindfulness. And a lot of these benefits are actually really helpful when we think about this in the context of a job search. So if we're thinking about seeing um, increased attention, cognitive performance, work performance, communication quality, well-being, these are all things that can be really helpful for us both as we go into um, interviews, kind of communications with people in organizations, but even as we start to transition into um, those full-time roles. We also see some benefits in terms of decreased emotional reactions to stressors, which can be really helpful for slowing down the occurrence of some of those negative outcomes of stress I talked about just a couple of minutes ago. All right. So now that I've told you a little bit about what mindfulness is, we're actually going to take a few minutes to practice mindfulness. And so for this activity, you don't need to do anything. You can just sit as you have been and listen to the sound of my voice. And when it's over, I'll let you know that you can open your eyes and return so you don't have to worry about when it's starting and ending either. Begin by bringing your attention into your body. You can close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. You can notice your body seated wherever you're seated, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, on the floor. Take a few deep breaths. And as you take a deep breath, bring in more oxygen, enlivening the body. And as you exhale, have a sense of relaxing more deeply. You can notice your feet on the floor. Notice the sensations of your feet touching the floor the weight and pressure, vibration, heat. You can notice your legs against the chair, pressure, pulsing, heaviness, lightness. Notice your back against the chair. Bring your attention into your stomach area. If your stomach is tense or tight, let it soften. Take a breath. Notice your hands. Are your hands tense or tight? See if you can allow them to soften. Notice your arms. Feel any sensation in your arms. Let your shoulders be soft. Now 
Notice your neck and throat. Let them be soft, relax. Soften your jaw. Let your face and facial muscles be soft. Then notice your whole body present. Take one more breath. Be aware of your whole body as best you can. Take a breath. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So welcome back from that brief mindfulness activity. Um, I'm curious if anyone feels like sharing, if you're still kind of very blissed out and would rather not, that's fine. But if anyone would like to share maybe how that made them feel or, or what that experience was like, either in the chat or unmuting yourself, I'd be happy to hear. Maybe I put everyone. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Personally speaking, I really enjoy mindfulness and it especially helps to have a guided practice because oftentimes it can be a little intimidating to just sit alone with your thoughts. And so personally speaking, um, I just felt my whole body relax and my mind quiet for once in the day. And that was really, really beneficial. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think you make a really good point about the guided meditations. And I think especially as we're starting um, a mindfulness practice, it can be really helpful to take advantage of a lot of the good resources out there and, and maybe start off with some guided ones so that we have some sense of, of support in that. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really great comment. Thank you. Okay. So in terms of implementing this in your day moving forward or in your life in general, um, so those guided meditations can be really helpful and I'll show you some sources for those on the next slide. Um, what we see from research is that practicing mindfulness for just 10 minutes a day for 10 days in a row is associated with reductions in depression, anxiety, and stress up to 30 days later. So you don't need to be practicing this for a very long time, although I know a lot of people do have fairly extensive meditation practices. You can start with just a few minutes a day and try to work up from there. Also, as I mentioned, it doesn't always need to look like a mindfulness meditation. We can also practice mindfulness during activities we do throughout the day. For example, um, I know a lot of us, myself included, will sit and have lunch um, or breakfast while I'm scrolling on my phone, you know, reading Facebook or answering emails and just having that meal, not doing anything else, just focusing on your senses and the experience you're having while you're eating that meal, that can be a way of, of practicing mindfulness that can be um, really powerful. So another um, option to, to practice. So I to these resources on the handout. So you have that, you should have access to all of these. These are three of, I would say, the most popular uh, apps for my are out there. They all have free versions with a lot of great resources. Um, I will say Headspace in particular is, is a favorite of mine and they're not paying me to say that, um, but they have some actually great resources right now for Michigan specifically and also um, resources around the pandemic that are free and widely accessible. And they've also recently um, created an offer for anyone who is unemployed to get one year of their Headspace Plus, which is their paid version of the app with a lot more resources. So that is also linked in the um, handout if that would be relevant for any of you or anyone that you might know and want to share that with. 
and they have a lot of guided and also some unguided ones um, as well on those apps. So the second thing that I wanted to share with you all um, is starting or cultivating a practice of gratitude. And so we see research on this in the social psychology, realm, but we've also recently seen it moving into um, psychology in the workplace or organizational psychology. And there's some kind of overlap with mindfulness in that when we're thinking about gratitude, there is this focus on the present moment. So really thinking about what we have in our lives right now and appreciating it both as it is today and kind of what has led it to be that way and we think of gratitude more broadly as a positive emotion and it's something that we can describe as a felt sense of wonder thankfulness or appreciation um, for life and i know that if we especially for those of us that might be um, struggling with a job search or maybe that it's taking a while, it might be really hard for us to feel gratitude on a daily basis, um, but there are some things that we can do to help increase that. And also, I want to just encourage that a lot of us still have plenty of things um, in our lives right now to be very grateful for, even despite these challenging circumstances. And so we see from practices of gratitude and interventions aimed at increasing gratitude, a lot of benefits things, again, like reduction in depression, anxiety, loneliness. Um, and in the workplace, we actually see teams who express gratitude for one another. They actually report having uh, more creativity among the team. So it's, let's say, something that almost creates a sense of psychological safety and appreciation where teams are then feel free to be more creative with one another. So thinking about this in terms of implementing this, there are really several different ways that we could implement a gratitude practice in our daily lives. And generally what we see from research is that people tend to have a stable or kind of baseline level of gratitude. So on average, people tend to have a certain level of gratitude, although there are things we can do to increase gratitude in our own lives. So one of those might be starting this gratitude practice where I would just encourage you to start off by picking one day a week. So maybe it's on Sunday or Monday at the beginning of the week and write down five things that you're grateful for. Now, typically this is what a gratitude intervention would look like. You might do this one day a week, as I suggest here. You could also do it every day, um, depending on what works best for you. What we've seen in some research actually is that people who do this just once a week are actually report being happier than those individuals who do this three times a week. And we think that that might be because doing it repeatedly, it kind of starts to become routine, just something you're checking off a to-do list. So. And this is on average, you might like doing it every day or once a week, I would encourage you to kind of play around with that and see what works best for you. The second piece that I have here um, is also another research and intervention that's research based to increase gratitude. And I would encourage you if you want to try this one to um, think about someone that's been, you know, particularly kind or helpful to you recently or maybe a while ago that you haven't had a chance to thank. And I would encourage you to just write them a letter of gratitude. You could write them a physical letter and mail it or send an email um, and just expressing your appreciation and gratitude. And what we find that just taking 15 minutes once a week to do this improves happiness and reduces depression. And the, I think, really interesting thing about this is those benefits occur even if you never actually send the letter. So even if you just write it all down and then put it aside and never give it to that person, you still will see some benefits from doing that. Although I would like to encourage you to actually send that letter or email so that you can extend those benefits to someone else um, as well. Okay. 
I was trying to keep an eye on time because I know we started a little late. I wanted to kind of keep it around um, the same amount of time that I had originally planned for. So those are kind of the two main strategies I wanted to share with you all today that mindfulness and gratitude, um, but the session handout have a number of others, things like um, tips for improving your sleep, um, making time for uh, mastery or learning experiences, taking time to detach or kind of remove yourself from work. Those can all be really helpful as well. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and I have some books here too, that if you're interested in learning more about these topics, I would recommend. I will just stop and again, thank you for taking the time to be here today. And if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer those. And I will say too, as one last plug before we kind of sign off, um, if you're watching this recording and have questions about anything I've presented here, please feel free to send me an email. I have my um, email address right here in the slide. Um, I also will be teaching a course on work and stress in the winter 2021 term, ORG 4900. So if you're interested in that, um, I would love to see you in the class or you can reach out to me for information on that as well. But good luck on your job searches, everyone. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin. I think I can probably speak for everyone when I say that you're a really wonderful presenter. Um, and this information is not only, you know, uh, these are not only tips and tricks that can be used during this stressful job search time, but this is information that we can take with us as a life skill. And I, I appreciate that so much. And I really always enjoy the, you know, in the moment mindfulness exercise. Um, and so, I just want to express my gratitude to you. <laughs> Maybe I'll write you a letter or an email after this <laughs> to express my gratitude for you taking your time, the effort that you put into this, and sharing your expertise with us. So, if if that uh, is it, and there are no questions, I think we can go ahead and sign off as a group. I hope that everybody really enjoys this beautiful uh, sunny weather. And just as Caitlin um, plugged uh, her class for the upcoming year, I'm gonna go ahead and plug career services. Please keep in mind that no matter what your major is, uh, no matter what your area of study is, there is a career consultant and a career services community here to support you. So, um, you know, jump to oakland.edu slash career services or oakland.joinhandshake.com to, um, to make an appointment with a career consultant. We can help you on this journey, this kind of stressful at times um, process of job searching, but that's what we're here for. So thank you everyone so much and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.